Hello and welcome to Third Thursday with the Allentown Art Museum. My name is Abby. I'm the Adult and College Program Coordinator, and I'm very excited to introduce another dynamic conversation. Tonight, um, our esteemed panelists will be looking at the works and themes presented in the New Century New Woman exhibition, which is now on view at the museum. We'll start with presentations from the panelists. Um, then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So I encourage you along the way to post any questions that you may have in the chat function, and we'll be able to get to some of those towards the end of the evening. Um, and without further ado, I'll get rolling with our introductions, and I'm going to start with our moderator, Miss Amanda Lavelle. Amanda Lavelle is the Director of Public Engagement at the Allentown Art Museum and has over 20 years of experience in the art and design industries. Prior to her role in the museum, Amanda worked in higher education at the Art Institute of New York City in various roles, including President, Dean of Academics, Department Chair of Fashion Studies, and Professor. Previously, Amanda also held roles and garnered experience in the fashion industry in corporate brand merchandising, marketing, event production, and in retail experience curation, both in New York City and London. She is passionate about design thinking and building bridges between the community and art. Also with us today, we have Dr. Ina Rabinovich Fox. Dr. Fox, or sorry, Dr. Rabinovich Fox teaches courses in American culture and history at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. Her research examines the intersections between fashion, gender, politics, and modernity. And she extensively published on these topics in academic journals and popular venues. Her forthcoming book, Dress for Freedom, The Fashionable Politics of American Feminism, examines how women used fashion to express political and gender identities and to promote feminist agendas during the 20th century. Welcome, Dr. Rebinovich Fox. And finally, we have uh, Claire McRee. Claire McRee is the assistant curator at the Allentown Art Museum and the curator for the exhibition, New Century, New Woman. She received her MA from the Bard Graduate Center in Decorative Arts, Design History, and Material Culture, where she received the Horowitz Foundation for the Arts Award for her thesis, The Debutante Slouch, Fashion and the Female Body in the United States, 1912 to 1925. Her areas of specialty include clothing and textiles, and the, society, or sorry, and the social history of gender, especially as it relates to posture, movement, and the body. Welcome, Claire. Welcome, Amanda. Welcome, Dr. Rabinovich Fox. So we'll get started with Claire, who will do a brief introduction of the exhibition, and then she'll roll right into her presentation. Take it away, Claire. All right. Thank you so much, Abby. Let me pull up my presentation here. All right, I'm so excited to share the exhibition New Century, New Woman with you this evening and talk about fashion and gender roles between 1890 and 1920. The New Woman is a term that was coined in 1894 that describes the broad opportunities that women were beginning to explore beyond traditional feminine roles in this era. Increasing numbers of women were pursuing college education or professional careers. Women were increasingly encouraged to pursue physical activity. And more women were also becoming engaged in civic causes like the settlement house movement, labor reform, and the suffragist campaign. And the fight for the vote really becomes a lightning rod in this period for the controversy over the change about women's roles in society. So the reason why this is a new woman is because traditionally femininity has been associated with home and family. In this era, there's not really any seen as any need or desire for women to take on a public role as the new woman is doing. That's really the male sphere. Women are caretakers of the family and the home, making it a space of beauty and a refuge from the outside world. And the debate over the new woman and women's roles in society is something that's really conducted through the mass media and through imagery in particular. 
And so as we go through this presentation, you're going to see various images of women where appearance and clothing are used as markers to debate the femininity and validity of these new opportunities that women are starting to explore in this era. So the exhibition, New Century, New Woman, looks at the question, how does fashion create and challenge ideals of femininity at the turn of the century? And one way that this happens is through borrowings from menswear, new garments like the suit and the shirt waist, which are a really important aspect. And that's something that Ina is going to touch more on in her talk. Um, and so I'm going to focus more on the feminine side of fashion in this period and how the new woman made meaning out of the highly feminine fashions of this era and engaged with them. So I wanted to start out by establishing women's, women's fashion and what were some of the markers of gender in fashion during this era. By 1900, there's been this dichotomy established between men's and women's clothing in Western fashion for over a century. Women's fashion tends to be highly decorated, showcasing a womanly body and have intricate detail and pattern to it. It tends to be more decorative than practical, whereas menswear is really more sober and plain. It tends to be loose fitting and cut, not show the same, the body in the same way. And so these, this separation between gendered fashions is something that really parallels the ideals of gendered spheres in society, that men are the leaders, they're conducting business, they're rational, whereas women are secondary and more ornamental or decorative. The silhouette in this era, around 1900, there's this very strongly feminine, very voluptuous silhouette that places a lot of emphasis on a full, low bust, and a tiny waist and full hips. And this silhouette is something that was shaped by corsetry that women were wearing. Corsets also influenced posture in this period. They were, the corset would push the chest forwards and the hips backwards to create this graceful S curve or monobosom silhouette. And in addition to the support of a corset, you can see in this garment from our collection in the the image on the right, that there's actually support additionally built into the garment to bolster this kind of artificial, very feminine silhouette. You have boning that's in channels radiating out from the waist of the garment. And this one also has on the right side, you can see there are layers of ruffles inside the lining of the garment that are providing additional volume at the bust line to fill out this monobosom silhouette and shape. And so around 1900, when you have this almost hyper-feminine silhouette, this, there's also kind of uh, a notable peak in the other markers of femininity and dress, things like the use of flourishes of trim. In this particular garment, you see lace and bows. It's a printed fabric. There's velvet and silk satin and embroidery. And so it just has a lot going on. And some scholars link this sort of hyper femininity in fashion to the anxiety about changing gender roles and that instability in this era at the turn of the century. I wanted to share one other kind of iconic feminine fashion from this era, which is the lingerie dress. The lingerie dress was called a lingerie dress because it borrowed techniques usually used for women's lingerie. Things like lace insertion, where you can see the, the fabric is actually cut away from under the lace to create this really delicate effect. White on white embroidery here in a really beautiful Art Nouveau whiplash floral motif, and also pin tucks, these tiny pleats that are creating shaping at the waist of this garment. And so, Additionally, the color white in this era is really associated with modesty and purity, these desirable traditional feminine traits. And so the lingerie dress really overall has this very feminine, very delicate, um, very delicate aesthetic to it. 
And this dress is a few years later than the garment we were just looking at. It's from 1909. And the really pronounced mono bosom silhouette has started to fade from fashion, but there's still a very strong emphasis on the bust and on a very curvaceous womanly shape. And so for something completely different, I wanted to take a minute to look at some of the caricatures and stereotypes associated with the new woman. The new woman was frequently caricatured as ugly, masculine, infertile, negligent, sexually promiscuous, really in opposition to all the ideals of the homemaker and the nurturing figure in traditional femininity. And so in this image you see a new woman who's wearing a really masculine style outfit in terms of her jacket, wearing a bowler hat with a feather, um, not at all like the, the clothing we've just been looking at. And you see that she's also failing to perform femininity in her behavior. She's abandoning her husband and children. This is another cartoon that uses women's appearance as a shorthand to condemn the the new opportunities and rights that the new woman was seeking. This particular cartoon is really interesting because it's poking fun at the illustration style used in fashion plates of this era, which was very modern and modernist and graphic. So this cartoonist was really paying attention. And in this image, the caption is, the only way we can gain women's suffrage is by making our appeal through our charm, our grace, and our beauty. And of course, here the joke is that the women don't have these three attributes. Um, these women, many of them are wearing glasses, which are not considered a stylish accessory at the turn of the century for women. And unlike the woman in the previous cartoon, these women are dressed in style trying to pull off the latest fashions, but they're not really succeeding. Um, they're too slim or too stout, their clothing is dragging on the floor. So there's kind of this ridicule of, you know, as women are trying to expand their roles, they're losing their femininity, their, their worth. And so for many, you know, these are humorous, these are satirical pieces, but there is very real anxiety about how women taking on these new roles will affect the social fabric and social order. And so for many women who were interested in pursuing some of the new opportunities associated with the new woman, one answer to this, this challenge of how to present oneself was to really be mindful of creating a genteel and ladylike self-presentation and by performing femininity with one's appearance, then they could gain greater freedom to challenge traditional feminine ideals through their actions. And so a couple of examples of how some women were doing this within the suffrage movement. Um, I have this quote from Votes for Women, a British publication from 1908. The suffragette of today is dainty and precise in her dress Indeed, she is a feeling that for the honor of the cause she represents, she must live up to her highest ideals in all respects. Dress with her, therefore, is at all times a matter of importance, whether she is to appear on a public platform, in a procession, or merely in-house or street about her ordinary vocations. So this idea of styling oneself is really seen as integral to the cause that these women are pursuing. And there are a number of women in the suffrage movement who use feminine fashionable appearance as something that's disruptive, reclaiming the idea of being ladylike as something that is not the antithesis of being a political subject, but that being you can be ladylike and be involved in politics. In these images, you see Christabel Pankhurst, who's a militant British suffrage leader with the striped collar in the image on the left. She's known for being very stylish and dressing in the latest fashions and really using her, her own image is remarked on in the press and is used to promote the cause. And in the right hand image, you see a group of suffragists. And while many, many suffragists did dress in more practical clothing like the shirtwaist or the suit, 
these suffragists are more dressed up in clothing, more like the dresses we were looking at earlier. And they're in Newport, Rhode Island. They're going to be campaigning, talking to wealthy tourists and encouraging them to support women's right to vote. And so they're really changing their self-image in order to appeal to their audience and you know, perform this kind of femininity that will aid them in their, in their campaign. In terms of women involved in the labor reform movement, being well turned out, dressing in your best for strikes was, was considered really important. And this image shows Margaret Hinchy, who led a strike of 30,000 laundry workers in 1912. And for this 1914 March, she's wearing a lingerie dress. And as we talked about earlier, this has those associations of modesty, purity, delicacy, it's a very feminine look and not threatening. So she's presenting herself, her claims as valid, that she is a respectable woman and you know, performing femininity in this public space. And the others in her march are all also wearing white, creating this really orderly and pageant-like effect. And this is something that within the suffrage movement the color white was commonly worn for demonstrations and marches and with much the same intention to use this um, kind of use this femininity in a very strategic way while making their claim for the right to vote. And finally, I wanted to talk about um, for African American women or women of color who were who were activists and who were fighting for civil rights or for suffrage, they were not only pushing back against gender norms, but also racial discrimination. In these images, you see Mary Church Terrell, who helps establish the National Association of Colored Women and is a founding member of the NAACP. And throughout her career, she's raising awareness about African-American progress. She's campaigning against stereotypes and she's also drawing attention to the dangers and injustices faced by Blacks living in the Jim Crow South, where the threat of lynching is a really real fear in daily life. And you can see in these images that she's really showing herself as a very stylish, very fashionable woman, and in very feminine styles as well. And so she's really using her appearance as a tool to, set, to show that she is respectable, she is a lady, she is worthy of the vote, worthy of civil rights, worthy of enfranchisement in American society. And so just to wrap up um, with this idea that we've been considering that feminine fashions and the very, the very feminine fashions of this era are not necessarily in opposition to the new woman's aims and goals rather dressing in a feminine way and following fashion is something that can be used to their advantage as a tool and and can even be subversive all right thanks thank you so much claire you offered us so much beautiful imagery and um, congratulations on the curation of the exhibit it's really beautiful um, next up we have dr rabanovich Fox, and she is going to be giving her presentation. I just wanted to remind everybody to please your questions that you might have in the chat section. And at the end of the presentation, we'll definitely be answering any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thank you again, Abby and Amanda and everyone in the Allentown Art Museum for um, organizing this evening and uh, curating the exhibition. Um, and following Claire's presentation, um, I uh, want to give a, a little kind of like the uh, maybe mirror image of the new woman or the complementary um, aspect of the new woman a little bit with historical background and really why fashion was uh, very important to the image um, of the new woman and the meaning of the new woman. Um, so as uh, Claire explained, um, the new woman is, is really a new concept or an, a cultural phenomenon of the, early, of the late 19th century and the early 20th century uh, that really pushes um, a new understanding of uh, what is American womanhood. 
um, that base on mobility, on athleticism, on youth, on visibility, really going out of the, um, of the home into the, the public sphere. And, um, and it was, uh, it referred both to images in the press, um, as Claire uh, showed us, uh, but also to real flesh and blood women, uh, mostly a generation that came of age between 1890 and 1920, um, that really uh, uh, experienced those changes um, in very much on their bodies um, in terms of changes in fashion and changes in dress. And um, so, but the new woman um, did not, was not only distinct or new uh, in her behavior and in her access to education, to sports, to politics, uh, but it also had a really distinct look in a sense. Um, and uh, part of it uh, was really uh, perpetuated by uh, the media um, that was um, becoming very, the, the popular uh, maybe uh, mode of uh, circulating image in that period. Um, and the most popular image of the uh, new woman in the press and maybe the most commercialized image uh, was of the Gibson girl. Um, Charles Dana Gibson, um, who was a famous illustrator, uh, gave this really archetype of woman, of the new woman in his um, illustration that really epitomized uh, this growing opportunities of women for work, for education, um, for uh, going in politics and also engagement with consumer culture and leisure. Um, that was also a very important aspect um, in this period. Um, the Gibson girl was also kind of like the perfect example of the college student. Um, um, women uh, are starting to go into college. There are still very uh, a small number compared to the population, uh, but they're very visible in the culture. Many of those students go later to become suffragists, to become reformers. Um, so they're very, very visible in the culture. And the image that you see here uh, with the girl, um, the Gibson girl with the golf club, um, the name of this illustration is School Days, right? So it's much more celebrating this image of the outdoors, um, of uh, someone that is much more athletic, uh, much more muscular in some sense, um, in terms of the delicate beauty ideal that was more in fashion of the true woman, the woman who stayed at home. Uh, this was kind of like a more confident, a more um, adventurous woman. Um, she was uh, very known for her ensemble of the shirtwaist, which is kind of like the female version of a, of a male blouse and a skirt. And this um, ensemble um, outfits were really becoming a uniform for this generation of new women. Um, and really the activities um, that they enabled, um, more mobility, they enabled riding a bike, playing golf, playing tennis, all of these activities are really uh, conveying this idea of new woman. And um, the ensemble um, also is, um, offers uh, a versatility for women um, in terms of their wardrobes uh, with one skirt and multiple uh, shirtwaist or vice versa. Uh, women can really uh, diversify their wardrobes even if they don't have the financial means to buy a lot of dresses. Um, Shirtwaists were not uh, an, accepted, an expensive item of clothing, so it was uh, kind of like a, a, a good uh, option for women who did not have a lot of money to still be in fashion. Um, it also brought changes to the idea of a woman's body um, in many sense, uh, be, because um, again, we're seeing the, the waist. Uh, there is um, when uh, bicycles will become more and more popular, um, the long skirt will be uh, 
transformed into a shorter skirt that really shows women's legs at the time, which would be a really big sensation that, you know, under that skirt, women had actually two legs and they can use them. Um, so this understand of a more functional uh, body, right? Um, the ensemble really pushes um, this uh, notion, the notion that the body is much more mobile uh, than it used to. And, um, and this idea of, of the body in motion um, that really uh, the ensemble uh, pushes um, to the front. And while the Gibson girl was a fictional figure, um, the commercialization of her image and especially um, the popularity of the shirtwaist and the fashion um, really enable other women to uh, take the, this image and to reclaim it as their own and to expand the liberating meanings uh, that the Gibson girl had. Um, so for uh, working class women, for example, um, the, they took the availability and the functionality of the shirt waist and really uh, use it um, as a symbol because most of them were both, um, especially the garment workers, were both the producers and the consumers of this item. And they use, um, you see here, Clara Lemlick, who was uh, one of the, uh, leading leaders of the famous 1909 uh, garment worker strikes in New York um, and Rose Schneiderman, who was another very famous um, labor activist. And they used the, also not just the um, femininity of the Gibson girl and her youth and uh, appealing because the Gibson girl was very um, kind of like she was the uh, beauty ideal of that period, every man wants to marry a Gibson girl. Um, so they claim, reclaim this image, but also the American connotation that the Gibson girl had. Most of these garment workers were immigrants. And by claiming the shirtwaist and the ensemble, um, they themselves claimed this, the right to be respected as workers, as women, but also as American citizens. Um, for African American women, as Claire mentioned, um, also the Gibson girl uh, was a route for them to claim racial equality, to claim this uh, being uh, the right to be respected as women, um, something that they really had uh, a lot of uh, time to, to really fight those racist stereotypes that even did not um, did not see their humanity, not to mention their femininity. So by the, they're claiming the right to be Gibson girls themselves, uh, Black women used fashion uh, really to change um, this perception that they are um, ugly, that they are masculine, um, that they are um, maybe sexually pr promiscuous. Uh, but no, they are respectable uh, college students. Um, the image that you see here of the four students in um, Fisk University in Atlanta um, show themselves that we have the right to be respected, um, just like uh, the Gibson girls, just like the white Gibson girls. Um, the Gibson girl herself was not an image that um, necessarily was associated with the more po politics uh, or the political new woman, the suffragette. Um, in the illustration, Gibson never um, portrayed her as marching in a suffrage march or doing some political activity. Um, but because many young students uh, started their careers um, in college, uh, the Gibson girl was this easy um, image that they could tap into. And again, uh, what Claire said, kind of like uh, diminishing the resistance to their claims, to their political radicalism by showing a more acceptable um, image of femininity. Um, and the functionality of the ensemble um, again, that the Gibson girl so much popularized was all, also um, helped them um, in uh, when they starting to march in the street and to parade um, 
the fact that they could march a few miles in very dirty streets, streets where then were not as clean as they are today, uh, without being concerned that their clothes will become a, a health hazard, really. Um, marching costume, the one that you see here on the right, um, really enabled uh, these suffragists to both represent this respectable image, but also to walk a few miles uh, without, you know, being too hard. Um, and um, the so so suffragists really took on this um, Gibson girl imagery, the ensemble. Uh, but another uh, thing that they really popularized that also had kind of like a more masculine um, connotations to it uh, was the suit um, that um, especially um, going on to uh, the 19 teens um, and uh, the silhouettes that, you know, Claire talked about the ass silhouettes and the narrow waist. Um, by the 19 teens, uh, silhouettes become straighter and narrower, um, kind of like moving into the 20s that we will see the flapper silhouette more in fashion. Uh, but that uh, process begins already in the 1910s. Um, and, and suffragists are really adopting this, um, this suit, um, again, because of its functionality. Uh, because of its utility, but also because it conveyed this respectable image. Um, they, um, they, they take this um, suit and they uh, not only using it in parades and other uh, places, um, whether it's their posters or their um, other speeches, um, but really, again, to convey this image of we are a determined, uh, we're not just the, those delicate women um, that maybe the lingerie dress shows, uh, but we're also, uh, we know what we want, we're independent, uh, we're strong women, and we really want the vote. Um, but what made uh, the suit so kind of like associated with the suffrage movement? Um, was not so much the fact that it did kind of like contain some masculine um, elements, uh, but more the fact that it contained pockets. And by uh, the mid-teens, uh, pockets, who was essential item in male clothing, uh, really become uh, a symbol and um, a metaphor uh, for women's rights and for women's suffrage. Um, the suffragist Alice Dewar Miller in 1914 um, had uh, uh, published um, in her column, Our Women's People, um, she published a short piece uh, titled, Why We Oppose Pockets for Women. And in it, um, she mockingly uh, detailed anti-suffrage argument, replacing the word votes in pockets to really show how absurd um, those uh, arguments are right because you know the majority of women don't want pockets, um, and if they did, um, they wouldn't use them. Um, to really um, and it really becomes kind of like a metaphor for suffrage uh, that becomes really popular. I mean, it becomes so popular that every item, every clothing item that contains pockets, whether it's a suit or a dress or a jacket. Um, really deem as a suffrage costume uh, just because it contains pockets. Um, so, so really uh, <laughs> suffragists really using it um, again to uh, push the idea um, of their right to vote. And, but what it's important to remember that while um, both the suit, the shirt waist and pockets do have this masculine elements to them, um, Contemporaries did not necessarily see these women as uh, masculine or as trying to be masculine. I mean, the Gibson girl, as I said, was the beauty ideal. It was like the woman, I don't know what, who is today kind of like the beauty ideal, but it was kind of like the woman that everybody wants to, got, to, to get married with. Um, and suffragists really managed to, um, in some sense, feminize these masculine elements uh, to make them more appealing and more um, 
uh, or less threatening in the public um, sphere, but also a way um, to express their freedom, their independence, their courage, um, that, um, that was not, was, you know, was new, was something else, but it wasn't an extreme radical, something that the public could not um, take in a sense. And what they did is really um, taking those elements and, and making them part of the mainstream and part of the way that every woman um, can look like and not to be ridicule. Um, and that was um, for them kind of like navigating between this hyper femininity and this masculinity enabled them to create this new idea of the new woman. So I'll stop here and I guess we'll move to the question round. Thank you so much. Um, Chris actually in the chat just said, who knew that pockets had such power? I didn't till now. And funny enough, I was just thinking the same thing. I was like, man, if I was a suffragist at that time, I would have been pushing those pockets everywhere. I would have been a pocket pusher. I mean, who knew? And that's crazy hysterical, that list that you shared. Um, but thank you so much for sharing all of your research and your expertise on this topic. We greatly are honored to have you here tonight. Um, and without further ado, I actually have quite a few questions coming in. So if you guys are ready to answer some questions, I think our audience is. Um, Lori asks, who are typically designing the dresses, men or women? For example, the monobism design. That's a great question. And in this era, really both genders are, are designing for women. Um, the S-curve corset that creates that very distinctive silhouette is actually something that's invented and promoted by a woman. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and it is kind of like the, the heyday of uh, female uh, uh, designers um, and uh, names that, you know, today are, are pretty much forgotten, uh, like Vionnet, like uh, Len Van, which, you know, her house is still, um, is still on, um, but Pekan, um, all these women um, are really big names in fashion. It's not that men are absent from that area, but um, it certainly is a much more women who design for women and really thinking about uh, women as active women, um, that they need clothes that will facilitate all those new activities that women are participated in. I'm glad that you mentioned other female designers because I think so often when um, individuals think of female designers at this time, they automatically go to Chanel. And I know you and I spoke about that a little bit, but we did have um, one question where somebody actually, Jan, asks you know, about Coco Chanel um, versus Perot. And she's just wondering um, you know, about that. And that was a question I had for you as well, Enov, you know, because so many people just automatically think of Chanel. Yeah, I mean, Chanel is kind of like famous, very famous today, um, and pretty much because, you know, she worked hard to be famous. Um, and, uh, but she was definitely not the only one, and she was definitely not the first. Um, and um, Poiré, I, I mean, was a big name. He would be kind of like a bit forgotten by the 20s, uh, but he was really an important person in, in really uh, pushing through those new fashion, through breaking this uh, silhouette, uh, the S-curve silhouette and, and in, um, introducing other fashions. But he wasn't, but on the other hand, he also designed, you know, the hobble skirt um, that really um, hindered movement. And, um, and he, he's, he famously claimed like, I freed the bosom, but I shackled the leg. Um, so there is this tension and Chanel, you know, she becomes famous um, mostly in the 20s um, with her little black dress and her flapper um, style. And she definitely made some um, innovations, but again, um, she didn't invent them. Basically, um, those ideas were already around. Um, Len Van and, and, and Vionnet uh, were there before her, were very much, much more famous than her um, at the time. Um, and they also kind of like uh, introduced a more flowing silhouette, a less constructed silhouette. Um, so that's for 
you know, it, Chanel, like we tend to think that everything started with Chanel, but that's not oftentimes the case. The case. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Um, actually, another question about, we, we spoke about pockets, so let's continue on um, something on that line. Belts, um, Chris is actually asking, were belts considered to be bold statements too, or did women wear them previously? I guess he's maybe referring to that, uh, or she, I apologize, Chris, I'm not sure, um, that belted jacket that you showed the suit um, alongside the pocket statement. Were belts something traditionally um, worn? Were they a sign of being masculine or feminine? Claire, you wanna take on that? Sure, I mean, you do see belts in women's fashion it, earlier in the 19th century. And I think the belt is something that's really part of becomes part of the shirtwaist costume and um, really enhances in in the earlier years of wearing shirtwaist that S curve silhouette with kind of a dip waist in front to create that shape. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's really versatile and wouldn't necessarily be coded masculine or feminine. Right, and I think um, part of it is also um, that also contributes to the changes in the silhouette in the teens is World War I and kind of like the, the effect of uniforms. Um, and that's where we seeing the more belt, belty things that are not, um, you know, uh, a more sashes type of belts um, that are kind of like maybe more feminine. Um, so, so those belts that are coming from uniforms are kind of like maybe coded more as masculine. Um, just because they are influenced by that. Um, but again, uh, because uh, it was kind of like a negotiation and there was a lot of, you know, there was the tie also uh, that women are um, incorporating to their own dress. But by they doing that, they actually feminize those, um, those items. So they're not trying to be men, they're actually feminizing um, men's clothing. That's a really good point. Uh, we have so many actually wonderful questions. I hope we are able to get to most of them. Um, Mary asks, uh, you mentioned that women might not be able to afford the new style clothes. Where were women buying their clothes? Um, it was too soon for department stores. So was it the local seamstresses? It was actually not too soon for department stores. It's kind of like the heyday of department stores. And even the bargain basements are starting um, to happening. So. Um, if a wealthy woman would buy on the first or second floor of the uh, of the department store, her, the retail uh, worker or someone who is maybe uh, less affluent uh, would buy in the bargain basement, um, like you know, like we we have today. Um, there were also push carts in in streets. Um, kind of like, you know, like we now go and buy, I don't know, a hot dog or something like that. So there were push carts of, um, of, of, of clothing um, that cost less and were also in far less quality. It's important to say, I mean, the quality is definitely not equal from um, a store bought um, uh, shirtwaist to, to, uh, um, to something that you buy on the street. Um, there was also um, uh, mail catalogs, um, right? Um, the image that was from Sears, you could have ordered that as well. Um, that was a good option for people who lived in more rural areas or um, outside of the city centers. Uh, but it's also a period where uh, women know how to sew and they sew for themselves. Um, not so much uh, poor women, uh, but again, uh, women who have more means actually have the skill to sew a shirt waist. Yeah, yeah, the shirt waist is one of the first really um, widespread ready to wear garments that's appealing for a lot of women in part because it's not a fitted garment. It's something that's very loose fitting and then you tuck it into a fitted skirt weight, a skirt and then it, it fits your body. And so um, so the shirt waist is really kind of an earlier example of ready to wear that really takes off um, in a time when women's fashions, as you saw with some of these garments, are really very exactly fitted to individual bodies and it's hard to replicate that 
um, from ready to wear before you get into more the 20s and 30s where the clothing lines are simpler and so it's easier to mass produce. Yeah, that, the freedom that came with the with with the shirt waist actually in the production of that, you know, that was it's just amazing how that leads to um, kind of what more similar in line to what we see today, right? On, on the market for women, it just kind of really lends itself to allowing women more freedom, you know, who'd have thought, but um, it definitely did. Um, kind of on that Gibson girl look, um, the Gibson girl look had such a huge impact at the turn of the century. Is there a comparable trend um, parallel to fashion today that you can think of? I have to say that the um, the big fluffy sleeves of the shirt waist that were very uh, popular at the late 19th century are now having a comeback. Why? I don't know, but um, <laughs> we do. And, and the Gibson girl did had like a few comebacks. She had a, a, a small comeback in the 40s, um, then later in the late 50s. And I guess now we also seeing a comeback of at least the big puffy sleeves um, of the Gibson girl. Um, I don't know if it is the biggest trend. I think the biggest trend now is face masks, but. <laughs> <laughs> Which funny enough actually does have a parallel to that same time period with the Spanish flu, right? Right. Yeah, we actually, we made a reproduction 1918 style face mask to include in the exhibition. Um, just, you know, because that feels very relevant and is a great connection. If you're walking in the gallery wearing your mask, then, you know, it's something you can kind of relate to. And so in this period, face masks were um, kind of generally constructed along some of the same lines in terms of the cloth, but a lot of the recommendation was to use medical gauze and people translated that as chiffon or cheesecloth or other loose woven fabrics. And and today the recommendation is to use tight woven fabrics that are more effective at stopping the spread of disease. I love that that was included in the exhibition because um, it's definitely obviously so relevant to what we see happening today. And it's always amazing for me to see the pictures from the same exact time period, you know, 1918 when the Spanish flu to today with, you know, COVID. And it's, it's really just amazing to see some of the parallels um, you know, in that sense. Actually, Jan, we're gonna take just maybe one or two more, but Jan says, could athleisure today um, be a similar trend as seen in like the Gibson girl look? Could that be kind of like an evolution of the Gibson girl look perhaps? Um, certainly, and, and especially in terms of, you know, um, the athleticism that was really connected with us. Uh, with that image. I mean, I think that now when we look on at the corseted uh, Gibson girl with her long dress, it's really hard to think about this as athletic wear, right? Um, or it's something that is athletic leisure even. Uh, but at the time, this was kind of like the improvement and that was the athletic wear of the time, um, even though it was with corsets. <laughs> and trailing skirts. Yeah, and I think with that, um, you know, in your talk, you were talking about the um, impetus for mobility and the desire for this new freedom. And I think that's something that's really part of our expectation for clothing today and perhaps is reaching its highest expression in athleisure in terms of the expectation for multi-directional stretch and for clothing that's loose fitting and moves with you and which is really having a moment right now, um, thanks to us all being stuck at home. And with pockets, Athleisure today actually has <laughs> pockets and we put our cell phones in it, right? <laughs> and everything else that we need to go running, walking, biking, you name it, we do it all now, which is, which is really amazing that these women really set the trail for us to be able to do what um, we can do and that we do today. So, um, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Abby, who has just some concluding remarks. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to close this out tonight. I want to thank you all so very much for joining us this evening. I also want to thank our wonderful moderator and our panelists. Once again, you guys were all so fabulous and you just have such a wealth of knowledge. And I just can't say thank you enough for sharing that with us today. 
Um, I'd also like to thank Ellie Lobner and the Society of the Arts for their contributions to the exhibition. And for everyone who's joined us today, I hope that you get to come and see New Century, New Woman in person at the museum. Um, it is on view right now and will stay up until January 24th, 2021. Um, the museum is open Friday and Saturday um, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Sunday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So again, please come and see the exhibition. It's, it is so beautiful. Claire, you did a wonderful job with it. Um, thank you all one more time and I hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks guys. <laughs>